All right, so today I'm talking about hiding in the pulleys and the strings. And so actually I was in London in May and uh, I was in an Airbnb and I saw this first edition by Robert Louis Stevenson, a book called uh, Essays in Writing. And the first paragraph goes as such. There is nothing more disenchanting to man than to be shown the springs and mechanisms of any art. All our arts and occup occupations lie wholly on the surface. It is on the surface that we perceive their beauty, fitness, and significance, and to pry below is to be appalled by their emptiness and shocked by the coarseness of the strings and pulleys. I was just blown away by this uh, because of the fact that everything I do online is about trying to help people understand the value of the products that I'm selling, the features that I'm promoting, whatever it might be, um, and if they knew how much work went into all of this stuff, uh, they probably wouldn't buy anything. So um, this actually spoke to me uh, a lot. So this is, this is what my talk is about. And so today what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be giving everybody kind of an overview of a few different types of websites uh, that we're all either managing ourselves, building for our clients, whatever it might be, and trying to um, reach out to users in what I think is going to be the most important way in which we communicate, communicate with users in the future, which is personalized messaging. If uh, anyone here works at Automatic, you know that I talk about this stuff nonstop to the point where people want to just um, put me out in the street. Uh, but I, I think it's the most important thing that we can be doing because if you think about the, uh, the way the internet evolved, um, how many people built a website back in like the 90s? Okay, and what did you think about when you were building a website? Was it a newspaper or a magazine, like that kind of layout? Um, that's where we all came from, right? Like it was an advertising print layout. That's where the internet kind of like leaned on, uh, you know, what it leaned on for layouts, design, things like that. Um, you look at like advertising billboards on the street. Um, those are designed to gather as many views as possible, but they're in no way personalized to the person driving down the street. Although I imagine that will change in the future. Uh, the internet though has the ability to personalize its messaging for everyone who's arriving at the website. And I think that's where we can differentiate ourselves and uh, really create a very unique experience. Uh, so I work at Automatic. If anybody's interested in working with me or some of our team members here, please visit this page. Uh, if you want to talk to me after this, you can catch me on Twitter. That's my handle. Uh, that's my blog. These are all very personalized handles uh, and URLs. So when we talk about personalization, Augmenting or otherwise changing a design based on specific user's intent. And the intent is the thing that I like to point out to people. Uh, you know, you may be uh, a man or a woman, uh, but you might be shopping specifically for clothes for your spouse uh, on a website, right? So it's not necessarily about what it is that you need or how you fill a demographic poll, uh, but it's what the intent is for you on that website at that time. Uh, if uh, you're interested, there's a really great talk about two hours ago that you can see uh, by Jeff Galinsky. Uh, it will be online and the slides are online, but I would definitely view this slide because it's a great pre precursor. Uh, so if you can't go back in time, totally understand, but check this, this presentation out. Thanks, Jesse. You're welcome, Jeff. <laughs> All right, so today's word of the day is confidence. And the reason for that is because a lot of what users do and the decisions they make on your website is based off the confidence that they will receive the information, the content, or the solution that they need at that moment. I'll give you a good example. This is the hotel I'm staying in right now. Yesterday I was packing to come up here to Maine and uh, my wife asked me if uh, we should pack a bathing suit. Is there a pool? I said, I don't know. I went to their website and uh, it's a little hard to see. But the top URL links are overview, photos, rooms, deals, spa, dining, fitness, local area, map, meetings, and weddings. So how do I find out if there's a pool? What do you think I clicked on? Photos. Spa and photos. I asked like five people before I walked in here, and those were the two main answers, and that's mostly what I heard just now. So if I click on spa, this is what I get, and it's a picture of a massage chair. And uh, if you scroll around, you learn nothing about whether or not they have a pool. Uh, so then I went to photos. And the thing is this, is that my wife, who has a travel degree, said you click on amenities. Well, there's no amenities link. Even if they had an amenities link, I don't know that I'd click it. Because the thing is that it's not just about 
whether or not they have a pool. It's about the end result for me is finding out if they have a pool that I want to swim in, right? Because I don't want to end up in one of these. Uh, and I've been to hotels where they have a four by four pool and it's just a cold hot tub. Um, right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so the, the lesson I'm trying to instill here is that at the end of the day, the word pool on a checklist of things that they have doesn't actually answer the question for me, right? I'm trying to understand with confidence what I'm clicking on is gonna get me the result that I want, which is why I went to photos versus then a list of amenities. All right, so what personalization isn't? Convenience. A lot of times people think that uh, I'll make this experience better, I'll make it faster, I'll eliminate steps, and I'm personalizing that experience. The thing is, is that we all want convenience, so it's not personalized to me that I want convenience unless you're this person who takes an iMac to a Starbucks. <laughs> and just to prove that I didn't just grab this off the internet, that's me. <laughs> and that's a person who literally carried a 27-inch iMac to a Boston Starbucks. Um, yes, my wife's actually like right here. Um, so unless you're this person who cares very little about convenience, we all care about convenience. So it's not a personalized experience to make your website a convenient one. Uh, I also have amazing design skills. Uh, but one thing I'd like to point out to you that good design is not a personalized experience. Making it look better is a great experience that we all want. But again, it's the same thing as convenience. We all expect a good design. It doesn't personalize it for me. If you've done a great job designing your website, it's just what I expect. Um, these companies in particular, though, have done a really amazing job personalizing things. Uh, Netflix has uh, shown you guys hundreds of thousands of hours of video that uh, you would never have found on your own because they show it to you in a convenient, well-timed, real-time manner. Uh, they base it off of things that you've watched. Uh, something that they do really, really well is their profiles. How many people utilize the profiling in Netflix? Yeah, okay. So my son has a very different profile than I do. I'm watching America Horror Story, and I hope to God he's not. He's probably watching something more kid-related. Um, but the reason for the profiling is because of the fact that it allows them to personalize the results for you in the future, uh, and it doesn't create some big mess of things. Um, Real-time personalization or personalization in, in general doesn't have to be super hard work either. And you guys can see I have a Sesame Street green Kermit the Frog theme going here. Uh, so today what we're going to talk about is opportunities for you to personalize the websites you're working on. And these are uh, little stepping stones. These are opportunities for you to break into this realm and do a good job of it. And then hopefully you'll get the bug and you'll want to do it all the time. All right, so the first thing I want to know is who's visiting your site. What is their intent? And what is the value to you? What is the, the value of that intent? Uh, so we're going to look at a couple different websites today. We're going to look at a blog, a restaurant, e-commerce site, and a SaaS site. When you arrive at a website, this is what you look like to me. You are a number. Uh, you are in a browser, on a device, and I might be lucky enough to have your location. But these pieces of information are enough for me to really start building a personalized profile and to start customizing the content for you. All right, so some of the things that I really love, location, device, whether or not they're a returning user, and if you can get them to log in, that's like the gold standard because then you can track all that information about them and understand their uh, use case on your website much longer. All right, so let's take a look at the blog. Goals. For me, I want people to subscribe, I want people to comment, I want people to share, and I want people to stay. Um, I'm going to make fun of a website today. This is my wife's website. Sorry, Joy. Um, yeah, I know. I got to go home. Uh, all right, so. That's true. Un under your guidance. All right. So here's a, a blog, and. Um, I arrived here at this page probably through some Google search or something that I did or somebody shared a link with me on Facebook. Uh, you'll see that there's a subscribe via email on the right there. Uh, she's connected her social media profiles, which is great. Um, let's take a look at that subscribe email. 
uh, right now, is it personalized? I have an email address. How many people here have an email address? <laughs> it is not personalized. But uh, if I get you to comment uh, and get some information from you, I can start to profile that information and start to customize things from you. Uh, the same thing goes for comments, though. It's not personalized at this moment. And, um, and you could be leaving any information you want. But this is one of the goals, right? So we said subscribe. We said comments. These are the tools that we have at our disposal. Sharing. Uh, these are the sharing icons from Jetpack. Very easy to turn on. And then I can click those links, and I can share those icons. At the bottom of her posts, we have a related posts area, which is great for increasing engagement. And we have a categorization area. And then these are tags. These little tag-looking things are, are tags. These are all things that are built into WordPress that we can start to utilize today to improve personalization. So we, what you want to do is, when you're arriving at the website, when these users are coming to you, you want to listen to them. And the thing is that a lot of people don't understand this, but all of the things that are built into WordPress right now will teach you something about your users. So in this case, uh, I arrive at the same website. But it's an article about Allermates and uh, the fact that our son has a very deep, uh, you know, bad allergy to, to uh, peanuts and some of the things that we do to kind of like accommodate him. Um, so as a user arriving on that page, what do I know about that user? Well, the fact that every single post on your website is a home page teaches you something. So what pages did I arrive on? What did I come to? Uh, that's all information that helps me understand and start to profile this user. It's probably not the case that I just happened to stumble as this is the first page, uh, like out of chance, uh, because of the fact that if I clicked on it from a Google search or I clicked on it from a social area, the, pro the, the, the thing in my mind is that I had intent to learn more about allermates and allergies, right? So at that moment, you can start to profile that user a little bit better. Uh, questions you can start to ask yourself within WordPress right now. Did they scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page? If so, then how much time did they spend on the page? Did they read the whole article? There are ways in which you can put little uh, pieces, like cookies at the bottom of a page. You can start to see whether or not images loaded at the bottom of the page, things like that. Uh, how long did they stay? Did they perform any searches? Uh, this is very easy for you to use. Any kind of like Google Analytics or Jetpack Search will tell you or Jetpack stats will tell you if people are searching. <clears throat> Did they click on the categories or tags? Again, categories and tags are so underutilized because of the fact that they're labeled and they tell you exactly what the user is clicking on uh, and, and, and gives you a broader range of what to write on. Uh, you should definitely be looking at that because that's intent and that's what you're telling people you want. Uh, to, they, they're telling you what they want you to write more about. Did they share and did they comment? So ways to personalize that. Uh, that subscribe widget, what if I just change the content to say don't miss out on allergy related posts? Because of the fact that they arrived on that allergy related post, it's categorized as an allergy related post. That's already the, all the information I need. All I need to do is swap out the content, the title of that subscription widget with the category name, and I've already personalized it a bit more for that customer or that user. Uh, the problem here with this website, and this is where I was saying I'm making fun of my wife a little bit here, is that she didn't categorize this, this post. So something to keep in mind, definitely always be categorizing your posts and tagging them because it's all information that you're leaving out in the wild that you're not, you're not gaining anything from. Because if everybody arrives in an uncategorized post, then you're not learning anything about it. Um, did everybody know here that every single category can be subscribed to on WordPress? So if you are writing, like me, about six different subjects that are wildly different, sometimes I write about hikes I'm going on with my family, I'm writing about personalization, books that I've written, every single category, you can type in slash feed at the end of that category or tag, and you'll get a specific RSS feed just for that category or tag. And in that way, that user can subscribe to just that information, personalizing their experience. Um, remember, with comments, you're getting their email address and their information. So this is an opportunity for you to follow up. Remind them of what they did on your site. Thank them for commenting. Recap their visit. Give them quick share links. So thanks for visiting my website. I see you commented on this URL, this blog post. Here's a few links so you can share it on Facebook with your friends, because obviously you cared a little bit about it. 
And here's a few other URLs or blog posts that you'd be interested in. There's no reason you can't email people who comment on your site, and I guarantee you that 90% of you probably don't do it right now. So it's a great opportunity for everybody. Uh, if anybody's ever getting a 404 or searching a site and not getting answers, this is another opportunity. I typed in the word gluten on my wife's website, and uh, the word gluten showed no results. So I can actually, uh, oh, and if you're uh, looking for an improvement on, Elast on search, check out Jetpack's Elasticsearch. That's my promo. I'll skip it. We'll keep going. Um, so search gives you intent, what you're missing, and an opportunity to reach out. Instead of having a blank page, ask for them to sign up to see posts that are written about gluten in the future. That way they have an opportunity to come back to your website. You are giving them an opportunity to, to learn more and you're getting an opportunity to reach out to them. We're one fourth of the way through. I'm going as fast as I can. <laughs> for whatever reason, instead of check marks, I decided to do Pac-Man eating lightning bolts. So we've done blogs on to restaurants. I like to pick on restaurant websites because I think Every restaurant website could be so much easier, but what are the goals of a restaurant website? Look at that. It's like you read my mind. Call the directions, make a reservation, uh, not time on site. This is important. The blog, the goal for the blog was to keep you on the site, keep you engaged, keep you reading posts, get you sharing. The goal for a restaurant website is not time on site. I want you off of that website as fast as possible because I want you to get off the website and come into the restaurant, right? So there's only a few reasons that you're coming. Uh, this is a restaurant in uh, Boston that my wife and I go to all the time. It's called Papa Rose. I love this restaurant. The food's amazing. Their <laughs> restaurant website is actually not that bad. Uh, it's very easy to scroll to the bottom. You learn about their locations, their hours, uh, all the information that I could possibly need. Um, but if my location is shared and I'm the user at the top there and I'm 500 miles away and I'm a user who's within 10 minutes, we can start to craft a, 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 a content-based solution for those two different individuals, right? So maybe for the person who's 500 miles away, they're more interested in a reservation because they're not coming in in the next two hours, right? They physically cannot make it there unless they're transporting somehow. Uh, but somebody who's within 10 minutes, what about a proximity coupon? Use this coupon in the next 30 minutes for a free appetizer. That gets that customer to walk past every other restaurant they're gonna walk down on that street and use that coupon and come in and, and, and come in there. This is very simple. There are tons of WordPress plugins that allow you to customize content based on location. So all you have to do is just use their IP or ask them to share their location. HTML5, when that came out, it made it so easy to use this kind of content and, and start to customize things. Uh, so instead of a pop-up that shows them uh, the opportunity to make a reservation, maybe you present them with a coupon. All right. More Pac-Man. E-commerce. Goals. Obviously, make the sale. You, know, you want to get their email. Um, Amazon is probably the best e-commerce shop in the world. Uh, you type in Google Home. They give you recommended solutions. They give you... Uh, answers or, or uh, you know, uh, choices that are based off of your previous experiences with them, things that you've purchased in the past, all that. Um, but there's little things that you can do. Uh, this is the automatic uh, hire us page. We're actually hiring for someone called a remote controller. I'm not going to even pretend to know what that is. But if you arrive at this page enough, we have a little thing here that says, hey there, couldn't help but notice that you visited this page a few times. Looks like you're really thinking about this or working here. Click here to apply, right? So when you're running an e-commerce shop, keep track of how many times somebody's viewing a product uh, before they've purchased. Some customers, I forget the percentage overall, uh, but we've looked into this, and, and, and it's something that's very common if you read about uh, making the sale in, in e-commerce shops. There are some customers who will literally just not buy anything unless they're given a discount. So they might view multiple times because they've been trained by so many e-commerce shops that they should have a coupon or a discount before they make a decision. So this is an opportunity for you to give them that discount. Um, so here's a, just a random shopping cart for a backpack. Um, I'm purchasing it. And uh, maybe I viewed this page a half a dozen times. I haven't actually pulled the trigger. Uh, boom, there's a pop-up that says take 10% off today. 
Sometimes it's the little tiny nudge that you need to get them to make the, the commitment to actually purchase. And you guys can't actually see that, can you? All right, so that actually says pull the trigger with 10% off. And there's, I'm surprised this is so washed out. I'm sorry about that. Have you guys been missing like half my presentation? No. Okay, all right, so this is the first one. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, cart abandonment is a big thing. So anytime that you can learn anything about customers, take that information and run with it. Um, a lot of times, uh, people don't know this, but like if you submit parts of a form, you can take that information and use it to your benefit, right? So if you have a multi-step checkout process, this is actually really beneficial to you because of the fact that uh, you'd think that a single page checkout process would be really beneficial because it gets them moving through the whole flow faster. But the thing is that you can't really collect any information at that point. Uh, so if they're abandoning the cart, uh, I guess you could technically start submitting information as they're filling it out on the form, but that's a level of creepiness I'm not willing to, to get to just yet. But as those individual steps are submitted, they're technically submitting that information to you. So you can actually harness that information to retarget those customers. So if you have a three-step pr checkout process and the first step is name and email, then you can start to grab those emails, put them into a bucket, add coupons to their, their email list, tell them about new features about the product, and continue to sell to them. Um, the coolest thing about email that I don't think a lot of people are benefiting from right now is that if you have an email like this with a coupon in it, um, I'll go back, like if you've seen an email like this uh, where you, you're given a coupon and it's just not the right time for you, you have no desire to buy, I don't know what it, chairs, I guess. Um, but maybe you need chairs, I don't know how many chairs you need, but maybe you need chairs in like a month. Um, you might go and type in uh, the name of that company and see all the old coupons, right? Which might be expired. <laughs> Here's the thing, when somebody views an old email, if you're using anything uh, modern, like MailChimp or um, Constant Contact or anything like that, there are tracking pixels inside those emails that give you an opportunity to say, hey, this person's opened that email and it's in a month old, it's an expired coupon, it is useless to them right now. So why not just send them the same email again with an active coupon, right? So you're tracking at that moment and you're sending them a real-time email live, uh, which is highly personalized and very effective for your campaigns. Uh, so you're turning old emails into new emails, which is definitely a good thing to look into. I love the idea of second, second chances. Um, so if, you're, if you've given up on a retargeting campaign, if you've done a drip campaign and it's just not working, um, try hitting them up again anytime they show any, any interest at all. And look at all the areas in which you're reaching out to them and ways in which you can re-engage with them. A lot of times people focus just on the website, uh, but if they're commenting on something on social media, if they're uh, opening an old email, all these are opportunities for you to re-engage. All right, so we looked at blogs, restaurants, e-commerce, and SaaS, and I'm trying to move quickly because I want to leave time for comments and for everybody to get safely across the street for lunch. Um, Goals for a SaaS site is making the sale, getting the email again. Um, this is a personalized uh, engine that I built at a previous company with the help of uh, actually Jeff Galinsky. Um, what we were doing is selling insurance, most boring thing in the world. But the cool thing about insurance is that most people need multiple types of insurance. Uh, so you can learn based off their location, uh, the things that they're interested in, what they're visiting on the page. Uh, and I like to use this example because of the fact that um, uh, it's, it's actually prime, but it, it, it uh, translates to a lot of different areas in which you can uh, benefit from this stuff. So the first thing, the first area where I touched on personalization, this was seven years ago. Uh, we had uh, insurance industry uh, sites that had 10, 12, 15 locations. And so what we started doing was sorting the locations based off of where you were standing at that moment with your phone or your, where you were on your computer. And we would sort them in order of distance from you at that moment. Because the reality of the situation is that insurance is all like a restaurant website. The only reason you're looking for the location is because you need a phone number or you need to go to that location at that exact moment. Uh, this was highly irrelevant to them. So they could just at any moment see the location that was closest <clears throat> to them. This was the first area where I really kind of like touched on personalization. But then we started getting a little bit deeper. And here's the thing. 
you might arrive at an insurance website because you need auto insurance. You're buying a new car today and you need to have it insured before you roll it off the lot. While you're visiting this page though, you may tell me personally through a form submission or something else, nothing about all the other interest needs that you have. But if I'm clicking on life, umbrella, renters, motorcycle, ATV, I can capture all of that information about you, bundle it up, and then ship it with a submission of a form when you actually send it. So this is something to think about. We're, we're constantly personalizing experiences using co uh, cookies, right? Grabbing different locations and what you're doing on a site, what products you're viewing, right? And storing it on your site, on your, in your cookies, so that when you arrive back at the site, it's personalized for whatever it is that you didn't buy or whatever you might need. There's no reason you can't take all that information and submit it through a form. So if I decide to click on motorcycle insurance because I own a motorcycle, then I go to auto because I need auto insurance today, and I fill out a form for a quote, there's no reason to not pass that information that I looked at motorcycle insurance. That insurance agent gets on the phone and says, hey, just so you know, we also have motorcycle insurance, and if you bundle those together today, you'll save 10%. Really personalized messaging for that person in real time. It's an opportunity for them. And it really touches on something that's really something like that I want to uh, build an entire um, following around, which is called fair trade marketing. It's a term that I'm trying to use more and more because I want people to do it because I think that we've built our entire advertising and marketing world on very fragile pillars. Uh, if you go to Amazon right now and you search for a backpack, then you go to a news site or a sports site or whatever blog you're going to, that backpack is now following you around, right? And it's driving you nuts and you don't even want to. And sometimes you even buy the backpack and they think you need six more backpacks. Uh, something I touch on with personalization is that like there are some products that you need multiple versions of them. You need to keep buying it, like a food item or something like that. You, you want to keep going. Um, but a uh, ceiling fan for a bathroom is something I purchased from Amazon recently. I don't need 12 ceiling fans for bathrooms. So I bought one. I don't need you to keep advertising to me on that. So when we touch on fair trade, uh, I'll kind of talk about this in some of the onboarding stuff. Um, and like I said, you can email this stuff to you. But think about opportunities where you can trade value to the customer for the information that they're giving you. So like in this example, you're actually, if you know more about them and you're in a position where you don't want to upsell to them because people are just past that whole car salesman type situation, if you can do a fair trade where I learn a little bit about you based off your browser history on my site, I can give you a discount. I can make your experience better, right? That's a fair trade. Same thing goes with onboarding. Uh, one of the things we built at Automatic is called Jetpack Onboarding. This entire onboarding flow helps you build a WordPress website faster. We use a metric called time to live. It actually helps you go from a vanilla WordPress install to a live site 400% faster. And it just does little things to help you along the way. But every single question is a fair trade. If I ask you, are you building a business or personal website? I am now profiling your website, trying to understand what kind of site you're building, and in exchange, I'm going to give you more tools. So if you select business, I might ask you if you need a map on your website, then I can give you a map in one click rather than having you try to figure out how to install a plugin and copy and paste the short code embed and do all these things. I can just trade that with you. Um, if you're doing a personal site, I might ask you more questions about blogs or themes or things like that. Um, the other thing to remember, and I kind of touched on this, don't back yourself into a corner. Um, and this is the example I just gave, so I kind of spoke a little bit ahead, but um, there are definitely some products here that uh, you don't need to buy 15 of. I talked about the ceiling fan. Um, and also, don't do a really bad job of personalization just in general. I don't know what happened to Amazon's algorithm here, but uh, in this screenshot, I actually had to block something out. I don't know if you can see it right here. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, women's wear that had absolutely nothing to do with any of the other products on this page. Um, and so, you know, I definitely encourage people to test and do fun things with personalization. Um, it's definitely an opportunity for you to 
grab small segments of your customers, do A-B tests, try some things out. Um, but just be smart. Don't offer me lingerie when my last browsing history was ceiling fans and like car mechanic stuff. Um, also, with, uh, with convenience and good design, um, don't make the experience uh, so poor for a user that they can't actually benefit from it. Uh, this is the MBTA app. Uh, I was trying to get a train out of Boston and I needed one for about nine hours from the time when I was browsing, but they wouldn't uh, actually show me more than three of the next train rides. So they thought they were doing something fun and personalized that I must need a train ticket right now, uh, so that means I need it within the next three hours. So they only showed me trains within the next three hours. There was no pagination and no way for me to do anything else. So I had to actually use the desktop site to buy a train ticket for uh, multiple hours in, 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 in the future. So just keep that in mind too. Don't back yourself into a corner. Don't limit um, accessibility content or uh, you know, the ability for customers to actually browse your content uh, because of personalization. And that's it. That's all I got. I try to leave time for questions. I think we have like seven minutes. Yeah. Uh, what are some tools you could recommend uh, so uh, just basic tracking is a great uh, tool. So if you're, like I said, if you're using any kind of WordPress stuff and you're trying to get really basic stuff out of customers, taking a look, uh, if you do a really great content um, architecture buildup, right, and you know categories and tags are, are applied well, if you're running an e-commerce shop, if you define those products into categories and things like that, then just basic stats will help you a huge amount. Um, you actually mentioned your talk, Hotjar. I love Hotjar. For anybody who doesn't know, Hotjar offers a few different things. Uh, heat mapping is one of them. The other tool that Hotjar offers that's pretty much my favorite is a live, real-time, one or two question survey. Uh, and it's super easy. It just pops up at the bottom. And you can just ask them a simple question. And don't be afraid to ask questions like this. Like, um, I would be bold. If we're looking at that e-commerce site again, and the person's viewed a, a, a product three or four times, but they haven't pulled the trigger, don't be afraid to ask them, would you have bought this with a discount? If I gave you a coupon today, would you be buying this product? Don't be afraid to ask those types of questions. It's not going to hurt anything, and your users will actually respect it. Uh, one thing that we actually touched on in, in Jeff's talk was that marketing isn't bad or evil, and people are fully aware of it happening all around them. As long as you're not disingenuous or trying to hide things from people, then you're going to um, you're going to pay them the respect that they deserve, and you kind of get back into that fair trade area. And I think that that goes a long way. Um, so those are two or three things that I like to use. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the prettiness factor. Yeah. So what's that fine line between um, <coughs> making the viewer a visitor uncomfortable versus getting information? Yeah. Uh, so the question, just so everybody heard it, was where's the fine line with the creepiness factor? Um, there's a famous, uh, I think it was a politician who actually said it, like, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it, right? Um, yeah, so it's kind of the same thing. Um, you'll know if it's creepy. If somebody half fills out a form and they give you their address, their physical address, and you knocked on the door and tried to sell them insurance, that's creepy. Um, but you know, I think that the further we get into the future, the, uh, the more people are open to these things. So when I was playing with personalization, that question actually came up more and more frequently. It's far less now, because I think people are a little bit more used to it. The other thing that I would really encourage you to do is do not be afraid to ask the customer to personalize things. They actually, at this point in time, in 2018, they're used to it and they're comfortable knowing that they're gonna train the website to do the things that they want it to do. So, you know, five years ago, asking for their location was like, whoa, you know, that's weird, that's creepy, right? Or knowing where they were, just saying like, hey, by the way, there's a Starbucks three, three minutes from you, would you like me to order you a latte, your favorite latte, the latte you ordered last week? That's creepy. Uh, but now it's a lot better, right? It's a lot more, people are a lot more used to it. So I would just say, like, just be open with them, be transparent, try the fair trade kind of thing in your mind that, like, I'm going to do something for you on behalf of you sharing something with me. 
and just don't try to be shady about it. Um, and don't be afraid to test it, you know? And I think you'll be able to draw that line for yourself. That brings up uh, GDPR. Yeah. Thing. Yep. Um, that we're struggling with that with web forms and what we need to be yeah. doing uh, to be compliant. Even though it doesn't directly affect us, um, it's just a matter of time before we yeah. find out it does. So could you speak? Yeah, so GDPR is a great example of um, kind of like the entire, op like uh, we push things too far. This is what I was saying, that like we built all our marketing, all of our audience uh, attractive stuff on fragile pillars. Uh, and GDPR, I think, is a reaction to that because of the fact that we've gone too far with personalization or grabbing people's privacy uh, data, private data and, and using it to our advantage. The thing about GDPR, though, is that it's, it doesn't make anything that we talked about illegal or that you can't actually do it. GDPR is about being completely transparent and open with the user, which is just as simple as uh, a little uh, tag at the bottom of the site when you arrive saying, I accept to these terms and conditions, and these are the things that I'm going to be tracking while you're here. And as I said, like the more transparent you are, the more comfortable customers are with that stuff. And then it's really about like when the user gives up and they don't want your product anymore, showing them and proving to them that you can delete everything um, or showing them if they make the request with GDPR compliancy, you have to be able to show them everything that you've tracked about them on a personal level. Uh, but the thing is, is that like you don't have to, I don't need to know your name to do, do a lot of this tracking. Um, if I know that you visited the peanut allergy category on my site, right, and so I want to show you more peanut allergy related things, I don't need to know your name, your email, and, and all that private information to be able to do that, and you can still be completely GDPR compliant. So the big things that I took away from the work that I did on GDPR compliancy at Automatic and with our lawyers was uh, just being overly transparent, be completely you know, aware of what it is that you're tracking, and make sure that customers know that they can review that if they want to, and then delete it if they have to. Oh, yeah. Nope. <laughs> That's what it says. But, uh, GDPR is global something protection. I forget. It's privacy, data privacy protection. Okay, yeah. And it's a European based um, act uh, that went into law in Europe. Uh, but I would imagine it being spread out across the world over time. Yeah. Um, a lot of the sort of like outlines of what they're tracking is very, it's like giant, you know, terms of, terms of conditions that are in place on like. Have you done anything that is smaller or more user-friendly or seen anything that are, that are like a little bit... Yeah, so, little bit. yeah, so the terms of service, one is that if your terms of service is huge, if it's a book, make it as human readable as possible. Um, be very clear. Don't be afraid to like outline in your terms of service, I'm going to track your location, I'm going to track what you fill out on a form, things like that. Um, but then when you get smaller and more granular with it, like uh, the browser notifications do a lot of the help for you. If you want somebody's location, Chrome will pop up a little window, do you want to share the location? Um, or do you want to do notifications, live notifications of updated content? Chrome will pop up a browser, right? But usually that comes after you saying it's initiated by something. So it's like you pop up a window that says, like, we'll sort these for you, these locations for you based on your location, share your location. You hit yes. Then Chrome will ask you, and you hit yes again. Um, those types of little tiny things are very granular and specific to the personalized information that you want. So those are good examples. I've noticed um, specifically with a lot of news sites, since GDPR went into effect, that a lot of people in the states are adapting it, and they, it produces a tiny pop-up at the bottom of the screen that may like, float with you on the website as you're reading, reading the article that, you know, this was that uses cookies, here's the information, <coughs> if you accept this, click here, or it just stays there and doesn't go away until you click it. Then you can continue to read the Yeah, that's, that's the weirdness about the GDPR law is that, like, if they don't agree to it, you have to keep, like, showing it to them. Because you really, the only other option is that they dismiss it, which means you kind of have to, like, turn off all of your marketing and, and every other tool forever. So every marketer is going to choose to keep that up until you agree to it, for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's say that you have a manufacturing site, right? And your manufacturing site is part of it. Yeah. Would it be great or would it be beneficial to a situation where you specifically ask the user, are you buying in bulk? Like, are you buying 10 widgets? Are you buying 20 widgets? Are you buying more than 100? And then yeah. you will be part of something. A coupon code or some kind of discount or some kind of yeah. offer to incentivize them to purchase that money. I don't
don't think that's creepy at all. So the question was if you're a manufacturing site selling parts, like would you, the user benefit from bulk discounts and how would you show that to them, would it be creepy? Uh, the thing that I would remind you though is that it's important to kind of classify that in real time. So if I'm just browsing your site, I might be browsing it because I want to know more about your manufacturing standards than the actual products that you're selling at that moment, right? So offering me a bulk discount at that moment may not be helpful. If, however, I'm adding additional products, like if I'm typing in one, two, or I'm trying to type in 20 and it doesn't even fit or something like that, that's a great opportunity to have a little pop-up and say something like, uh, if you're looking for more of these, we have a bulk discount. Add 15 more and you get 10% off, that kind of thing. Or even like, could it work where you're, you're trying to profile customers to say, like, even just propose that question, do you buy it? Or are you going to plan on buying more than one of the types? Absolutely, yeah. I love questions like that. If you, and again, it goes back to the fair trade marketing. If you're asking a question, um, are you going to need 100 of these? Yeah. If so, we can give you a discount or a lot of times what I see is that they, if you end up going into like a sales funnel with a salesperson or something like that because it's a bigger product I like. Mm -hmm. But either way, do not be afraid to ask questions like that. At the very least, I mean, worst case scenario, they dismiss it, but at the very least, you're learning about that customer in real time and if 90% of your customers say no, then that's a marketing opportunity for you to start reaching out to those bulk uh, purchasers, right? Like, because you're now identifying the fact that only 10% of your customer base actually are interested in, in bulk. Maybe you're not advertising in the right areas and, and building on that product line. So definitely, anything you can do to profile is I'm all for. Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, we got to cut it? I'll, I'll be outside and I'll, I'll answer more questions.